Hey everyone, Brian Zane here. Well folks, it is the dawn of a new era in WWE, the Triple H era. That is the big message they really wanted to hammer home to you this weekend when they put on WrestleMania 40 in Philadelphia at the Lincoln Financial Stadium. This was definitely a statement show for this new era we are living in today as wrestling fans. If you look at the way the show was presented, the way it looked, and certainly the results, of the show, what they told you, what they showed you uh, this past weekend, it is not Vincent Mann's WWE anymore. They went to great lengths to try and, and hammer that point home in many respects. And uh, I think that this was certainly a fantastic show overall, you know? I don't know if this is the recency bias talking. I don't know if it's a repeat of what happened in 2014 when I said that WrestleMania 30 made a case for being the greatest of all time. I think when you look at the significance of the show, the timing of it, and how everything went down, Maybe you could make a case that 40 is right up there with the top manias of all time. I'm going to say right now, is in my opinion, it's easily top five. So we will discuss the show and how things went down and uh, just try and recount the craziness that happened this past weekend at Lincoln Financial. One of the big reasons we chose not to go to Philadelphia this year for Mania, my crew and I, was uh, the time of year that it is and the part of the country where it is. You know, I was there at MetLife Stadium at Mania 35. In particular, the aftermath, you know, after the show being out there amongst thousands of other people stranded waiting for trains to take us out of MetLife as rain was just dumping on us nonstop. And I didn't want to live through that horror again. I did not want to go attend a mania in an open air stadium in that part of the country in the springtime. That just seemed like a horrific gamble. Uh, luckily for the fans in attendance, there was no rain uh, during the shows and they let you know about it because they had frequent weather updates as night one went on. And they did it so much, in fact, on night one, we actually kind of had a running bet going as to how many times they would update us on night two. The show begins with Triple H making his way to the ring. He's very short and sweet in this one. He welcomes everybody to a new era, welcomes everyone to WrestleMania, and you just know that that soundbite is going to be the new clip that airs in perpetuity. Now that they're getting rid of Vincent Mann's, welcome to WrestleMania. They're not going to have that anymore. It's all about the Triple H era now. First match of night one was going to be for the Women's World Championship as Rhea Ripley defended against Becky Lynch. Rhea got the live music treatment from Motionless and White for her entrance. And Becky's intro was pretty cool too because she got to incorporate, you know, her new autobiography that came out. And they had the big AR book floating uh, in the stadium as you hear her voice narrating some of the passages. We get clips of her career progression, including her Irish jig dancing when she debuted in NXT. She bursts through the AR book, much like Steve Austin at Mania 13, breaking through the glass. Uh, and she's got like bits like pages from the book, like part of her dress as well. I thought that was a really cool look for her. Very cool entrance. I also really enjoyed the championship intros throughout the whole weekend, like the 8K camera showing the challenger, the champion with the special graphics underneath. Samantha Irvin, oh my God, like what a tour de force she had this weekend. Uh, I think, you know, it's been said before by a lot of people and I'll echo that sentiment. I think that she is doing a great job as the ring announcer now. And I think her delivery was so strong. You know, definitely one of the MVPs of the whole weekend just in her delivery alone. Also, they mentioned that Becky Lynch was sick with like a 102 degree fever and strep throat. In the days leading up to this show, I'm like, oh, that seems like COVID taught us nothing, evidently. <laughs> it's a great matchup here with these two. The story is that, you know, Rhea is obviously bigger and stronger and more imposing than Becky, but she's faster and she's scrappy and whatnot. She's targeting Rhea's arm a lot in this thing as the match goes on, but Rhea is really using a lot of her power here. I love this one spot where they're on, the, they, they make their way to the outside, and Rhea's got uh, Becky on her shoulders and does an electric chair drop to her on the floor. I mean, and that's simply gnarly. Even though Becky was not at 100% in this matchup, even though she was ill, she still put out a really good performance, uh, looking really tenacious in this matchup. She kicks out of a riptide, she kicks out of a frog splash, and really has Rhea on the ropes a couple of times with that, you know, disarm her and whatnot. But again, Rhea is too strong, hits her with a riptide into the top turnbuckle, and then does it again, a like normal style, in the middle of the ring. Rhea wins, retains the championship, her year year-long reign continues. Uh, this is one of my picks for uh, you know, one of the best matches 
of the evening. I'm not going to do star ratings for this Mania. I wasn't taking fastidious notes, but it was still just a great matchup overall. Uh, you know, I was thinking that maybe there was a chance Becky could win because, hey, she's got this new book out and this is how they're going to you know, promote it by having her be the champion. But, you know, I think you just look at the future and you look ahead and you realize that, you know, there's still a lot of potential for Rhea as champion. I think that her list of potential challengers is a lot better at the moment than like what Becky hypothetically could have been at that point. And like I mentioned in my predictions, she does not need the championship. So Rhea continuing her her build going past a year now, I think is very impressive. And uh, yeah, great way to open the show. Oh, before I go any further in the show, I did want to bring up, you know, the big Prime logo in the middle of the ring all weekend, not to mention how almost every other square inch of space in that stadium was taken up with some kind of sponsorships, like the apron, the barricade, the ring posts, uh, you know, obviously those spots, you know, above the tiers separating the different levels in the stadium. I'm surprised that the canopy above the ring wasn't sponsored. It was actually one of the few places that didn't have a sponsorship on it. I was also kind of disappointed if they weren't going to sponsor it, then at least have it kind of themed, you know, to tie in with Philadelphia. Have it shaped like Independence Hall or the Liberty Bell or something. But yeah, man, it was like, that was one thing that was kind of distracting at certain points more than others was all the advertising. I know we saw it last year at WrestleMania and we saw more of it this year and I'm not going to get mad. I'm not going to begrudge WWE for getting that money. You know, that's great. Good for them. And I think that, you know, they have a lot of space to advertise on, but I think it was a little much this weekend. You know, there has to be some kind of happy medium where you can show sponsors and not just totally distract the viewer from everything going on in the actual match itself. It was just a bit much at times. The Prime logo in the middle, I thought was some of the most subtle marketing of the entire night. But when you've got like dude wipes all over the place, you've got like wing stop and all these other bright things, again, it can be very distracting. Man, like look at all the things they're just putting sponsor logos on, like the turnbuckle pads as well were affected. At what point are we gonna get to like this phase where the wrestlers themselves are commodified, where it's like, let's put a sponsor logo on their gear. I mean, you know, Lesnar is an example of that, but he's his own entity. And I would imagine we're gonna get to this point now where like shit, wrestlers are gonna start getting like sponsorships and they're gonna get the, you know, prime and dude wipes and stuff plastered all over their gear. Yeah, DIY, the awesome truth, New Catch Republic, The New Day, The Judgment Day, and A-Town Down Under in a six-pack tag team ladder match for both the red and the blue tag belts. I do like some of the special Mania gear that some of the wrestlers came out to. You know, you've got this weird Slipknot looking mask for Finn Balor and this kind of evolved uh, grotesque purple cane mask. DIY coming out dressed as Triple H and Shawn Michaels. I mean, Champa looked like Triple H had been in the dryer a bit too long, if I'm being honest. And uh, then you got big consequences Creed vibes from Xavier Woods coming out. You know, he and Kofi are dressed in like the Rocky themed references, but it just works out so well for Xavier Woods and his past in TNA. This was a frenetic, crazy ass match. I said during the predictions video, this has all the potential of a massive clusterfuck where it's not going to look good, but I think that they actually pulled it off really well here. I love Tyler Bate. His big moment in this matchup here was getting Finn Balor on his shoulders and the ladder and doing the Terry Funk spin around spot. That was incredible to see. I mean, New Catch Republic, I think, looked great in this matchup. The dual moonsaults. We get a repeat of that glorious moment in the Rumble match this year where R-Truth goes for the hot tag, even though it's not a tag team matchup. I love the way that The Miz played into that and the Judgment Day kind of like eh, the looks on their face. That was great stuff. The crowd going absolutely apeshit when Truth gets that big hot tag and does the John Cena spots. Grayson Waller and Austin Theory, A-Town Down Under, they grab the SmackDown tag titles, which means the red belts are still up for grabs in this matchup. Grayson is immediately killed off after grabbing the belts because he is knocked off and dumped through a ladder on the outside. You won't be seeing him for the rest of this matchup. There's a big tornado DDT by uh, Gargano through a table. Champa hitting Tyler Bate with the air raid crash off one of the very tall ladders. There was a point in this matchup where I think we were all kind of holding our collective breath because there's this ladder everyone's trying to climb onto and one of the legs is clearly broken and it's just like, you could tell they're one just false move away from the whole thing collapsing on them. JD McDonough gets involved, the uh, latest member of the Judgment Day. He tries to help Finn and Damien out. For his troubles, he is thrown off the top rope through a pair of tables 
onto the floor. The match ends when Truth gives the AA to Damian Priest out of the ring and grabs the red belts from the top of the new ladder, the non-broken ladder. So R-Truth and The Miz win the Raw Tag Titles. The match is over and you have two new sets of tag team champions. You know, I said in my predictions video, I was kind of against the idea of splitting the belts up because they went to all the trouble of unifying them. And But you know what? The tag team division is, I think, robust enough after all that it makes sense to have them because you got all these teams I think all these teams are, you know, great in their own respect, and I think are all certainly worthy of getting those looks as tag champions. And now that they're split again, I think you will have those opportunities. But this is a fun match. It was really cool to see our truth finally get a win at WrestleMania. And man, I didn't think anybody could convince me that The Miz could work as a babyface. But when you've got him and Truth together now, it's just it, it makes sense. I'm firmly behind it. It's a wonderful story. And it's a great redemption arc for Truth, not just in terms of the storyline and everything he went through with the Judgment Day uh, and for Miz as well, but also talk about the redemption for Truth when you know the story of how that, that, that injury that took him off the shelf almost led to an amputation of his leg and for him to come back and, and still be so wildly entertaining and as fun to watch as a fan and to see him succeed in this big moment. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. In a tag team match, Andrade is a last minute substitution for Dragon Lee, and he's gonna team up with Rey Mysterio to take on Dominic Mysterio and Santos Escobar. I was kinda disappointed to see Dragon Lee bumped off the Mania card on the SmackDown before the show. Not entirely sure what the story for that is, but I think Andrade, you know, he's a guy who, you know, big Triple H guy. I think he'll fit well in this new regime. You know, he debuted, re-debuted at the Royal Rumble, and you consider the fact that Boy, he didn't really live up to his full potential the first run in WWE and then he did dick all in AEW and so him coming back I think people were kind of disappointed that he wasn't going to be on the card until he was that last minute replacement so we'll see how he does in this new uh, run that he has in the company but a lot of bodies out there in this matchup because you had the LWO you had Legato del Fantasma there's all these people to surround in the ring at any given time it's a fun matchup and I think Andrade and Mysterio right away had some good chemistry I love the spot where Mysterio is on Andrade's shoulders and they do the cross body to the outside. It's a really fun matchup here. I love how Dominic has just evolved and kind of come into his own so much as a character in the last couple of years, even from last year to this year, I would say. And the stuff with he and Ray was fun to watch as well. Their chemistry as, as rivals is actually really, really good. Um, there's a great moment here. I forget what show this last happened on, but they got, you know, Joaquin Wilde on that middle rope and the LWO just launch him and he flies like 40 feet it seems uh, onto the ramp onto the legato guys then dominic's got a steel chair and then these two massive men in philadelphia eagles luchador mask take it away from him then you've got andrade hitting the message on dominic ray hitting escobar with a frog splash to win for the lwo then we find out it's jason kelsey and lane johnson of the philadelphia eagles who are under the masks and of course gets a massive pop there in philly as they celebrate with the lwo there were so many opportunities it's seen for this match to go darkest timeline and be like, oh, Ray's going to get betrayed by Andrade or it's going to be betrayed by Carlito or whatever. And we didn't get that. I'm not sure if we're like never going to get that, but I like the fact that it was pretty straightforward, pretty clean, you know, Kelsey and Johnson saving the day for the good guys, uh, you know, Dragon Lee not getting involved at all. I thought was interesting. Again, I don't know what his story is, but uh, besides that, this was just, yeah, it was a fun tag team match. No real stakes involved involved or anything, but it was still just very entertaining. It's Jay Uso versus Jimmy Uso. Yeet versus no yeet. Brother versus brother. And oh brother, this match stunk. Uh, I will say that the um, the hype package was great. I love the hype package for this matchup. That was beautiful stuff. Uh, showing them growing up together, uh, using their real names in this one as well. And the, the, the theme, the motif of I am my brother's keeper. I am not my brother's keeper. Beautiful stuff. And then the bell rang, man. And then it was just a big super kick buffet. That's pretty much all it was. With some like bloodline story beats kind of thrown in there for the emotion and whatnot. But yeah, I don't know. Fans weren't digging this one. I don't know if it was because it was kind of cold out and the fans are just kind of conserving their energy to stay warm or the fact that, yeah, I just don't know if Jay and Jimmy like had the 
the, the juice to get this uh, crowd into it. There's this big point near the end where Jimmy mid-match stops to apologize to Jay and the fans can see it's a trap, but uh, oh, Jay, he's just too pure of heart and he goes to the hug and then psych, it's a trap and, and Jimmy does the super kick and does the Uso splash to try and win. Uh, there's a kick out and Jay ultimately comes back with his own spear and then a twisting Uso splash. He's got changed direction in midair, which is always impressive for the win. Uh, I mean, you know, if you like super kicks, this match is for you, honestly. And I think that that's not enough to, to buoy this matchup for me. It was, I think, of all, the whole weekend, this is the weakest match of the, sh of the whole shebang. And I think it's disappointing because, again, the story is there. I love that story of Jay versus Jimmy, brother versus brother. But and for whatever reason, it just didn't work out. And it's the match that, uh, yeah, I was not happy with. A six-woman tag team match as Damage Control took on Bianca Belair, Naomi, and a debuting Jade Cargill. What a powerful looking trio that was there. I loved their uh, descent on the big platform on the stage they made their way down. In my mind, I was just kind of imagining that uh, Bianca's ponytail was like a propeller and she was just spinning it really fast as it lowered down there. Let me believe what I want to believe, okay? Uh, the big story of this matchup here, though, is uh, Jade Cargill. They kept that, you know, she stayed on the apron for, you know, 85% of the matchup here. It's the other five women doing a lot of the heavy lifting, and uh, they're all very impressive. Uh, Bianca Belair, I love her strength. I love her agility. The fact she does the press slam and then does the moonsault onto all three members of Damage Control. And then Jade finally gets tagged in. The crowd pops huge for her, and it's all Jade from here. It's just power move, power move, power move, like this is probably the hottest of hot tags you're going to get all weekend on this show. Well, save for our truths hot tag during the ladder match. Uh, at one point, Asuka accidentally hits the poison mist on uh, Kyrie. Dakota Kai is hit with the glam slam by Jade for the baby faces to win. And there you have it. This was a match, you know, this match was like fine for me. It wasn't like a spectacular match on the level of what we'd seen earlier in the night, uh, but it certainly was no Jay versus Jimmy. I think that was a match that helped kind of like get the fans to warm up again. Cause again, they were very excited to see Jade wrestle and uh, she did not disappoint. I think that just, you know, from that limited sample size we saw in this matchup, I think she did great, looking like a star, as she often does. And uh, yeah, putting the rest of the women's division on notice, certainly. I think that that whole trio of Naomi, Bianca Belair, and, uh, and Jade, what a powerful looking trio that is. And I think those three in particular are gonna have great things happening uh, in the in next year to come. Gunther's 666 day reign with the Intercontinental Championship on the line as he takes on Sami Zayn. And the devil really is in the details in this matchup here. You see Sami getting ready for the match. You've got his wife and his son wishing him luck backstage. That was a real wholesome moment. Then you got Chad Gable, his coach throughout all this, says, I can't be with you at ringside tonight, but you'll go out there and you're going to owe me a favor when you win this thing. And then Kevin Owens there at gorilla position. One final cheer on for him. Gets Sammy fired up. It gets me fired up for this matchup here because I was very excited for this one going into it. And it did not disappoint. I love this matchup. I mean, this is, pro this is probably my favorite matchup of night one. Dare I say of both nights, uh, for a couple of different reasons, but this was physical. It was every ounce of physicality you could possibly expect from both guys. I said in my predictions video, I love Sammy's selling, and I think that Gunther has one of the most physically imposing offenses of all time. There's the chops, there's the boots, there's the power bombs, spamming power bombs onto Sammy, and now he's starting to talk trash to Sammy's wife as this is going on. Gunther just continues to pound away on Zayn, all the power bombs, all the splashes. Sammy just keeps kicking out. You, know, you don't know where he's getting this from as Gunther continues to you know berate Sammy's wife. Finally, he goes for the top rope and Sammy hits him with the haluva kick and hits, oh my God, just the way we all just exploded at uh, Mr. Ulala's house when we're watching this and seeing the giant brain buster onto the top turnbuckle pad. I mean, that's a move that, that Sammy has not hit since before he went to WWE. So that is a deep cut there. And it's so brutal. I can't believe there are people out there on internet online who are like, oh, it's Botchamania. Setting up for two more big haluva kicks. Sammy pins and wins to snap the reign. The 666 day record breaking reign with the championship is officially over as Sammy Zayn wins 
regains the Intercontinental Championship. My God, what a moment this was. This, if this wasn't the best match all weekend, then it's definitely up there. Uh, definitely, I think it was the best match of night one, certainly. Uh, just what an amazing story this was. Uh, you know, Sami Zayn. Uh, people out there are going to say Sami didn't need the win, but I think he did. You know, when you consider where he went from last year's WrestleMania to that just trajectory he went on, this big reverse bell curve, it seems, from then to now, LA, uh, from LA to Philadelphia. I think uh, he definitely needed that. And, you know, Gunther had done all he can as Intercontinental Champion. And uh, I think he's going to be set up very nicely for a, as a future opponent for somebody uh, as, as the rest of the year goes on. But Gunther did a great job as champion. Sammy uh, was a great scrappy underdog in this thing. And the added element of getting like the wife involved, I thought was like a nice touch. And just, yeah, uh, what a great and that was for Sammy to bust out this super rare move looks absolutely devastating. It's all, it's what you can do. It's what you have to do to take down the monster Gunther. And I think that was a really cool moment. It's time for the main event of night one as Cody Rhodes and Seth F. Rollins take on The Rock and Roman Reigns. The Rock in his first WrestleMania match since 32, his first actual WrestleMania match since 29. Uh, if Cody and Seth win, then it's going to be a straight up one-on-one -on -one match with Cody and Roman on night two, but if Rock and Roman win, it's bloodline rules. So that was the big stakes going into this matchup here. And oh boy, The Rock is back in a big way. That entrance he had was one of the most epic things I think I'd ever seen. Just, you know, the video game graphics, the final boss loading, whatever. Uh, then you've got all the lightning coming from the set. The Rock comes out with the big fire in the shape of his Brahma Bull logo. He's got his big Brahma Bull belt, the People's Championship belt that was bestowed to him by the widow of Muhammad Ali the night before at the Hall of Fame. You know, years and years ago, there was that Brahma Bull, like, rock belt that was sold as a toy, and then everyone kind of assumed, oh, well, you know, Steve Austin's got his smoking skull belt. Clearly, this is going to be the Rock's custom belt. And there was one that was apparently made, but never ever used on television and that was always kind of a big what if well now we've come full circle the rocks finally got his Brahma Bull belt yeah, he's the people's champion he's got his own belt now it's 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 the beginning of a trend that I noticed this whole weekend where I'm like Jesus everyone's got a belt and so he's coming out with his big belt and the fire and the vest and the pants and it's this whole big thing it's just a very epic intro befitting, you know, the head of the board of TKO. Get the big stare down with all four guys. The Rock is just, you know, looks impeccable. At his age, he still looks like a video game character. He truly is the final boss. I mean, that guy found the Fountain of Youth a long time ago. And once again, he's continuing to wear wrestling boots that accentuate his calves. So staying with tradition there is uh, The Rock. And, uh, you know, at the beginning of the match, when I see Roman and Seth, like the big respect respective champions facing off to start things off. I just had this moment like, man, like Roman and Rollins is like what they wanted John Cena and Randy Orton to be many years ago. Like those are the two guys who came up at the same time and everyone thought that these two guys, they're the ones who are gonna feud and be just the defining rivalry of their era and their generation. And every time you put them together, it just didn't quite feel right. It didn't quite click. You know, but you see Seth and Roman here at this point. I'm like, this is what they wanted. This is the kind of, you know, vibe and the prestige and the aura that they wanted with those two guys that they never quite got. And here on this massive stage, like that's what you're getting there. Like it's 10 years after the shield broke up and you've got all this, you know, history between them. And here's where it's playing out. And I'm like this clicks so much better than Orton and Cena ever did. The Rock finally tags in. In, looks very imposing. At some point, all four men go out and they do this big brawl. Like the Rock goes out into the crowd, and you got everyone fight on the stage. They have the split screen, and but like the one thing that I could not shake watching this match was like, man, everyone's just fighting each other really light. Like nobody wants to hurt each other because they got this big match they got one night later. So everyone's just kind of fighting with kid gloves. I felt that that was 
a persistent trait that I noticed in this matchup here where nobody really wanted to hit each other all that hard. And I think that showed in this matchup. And you got The Rock, who's the real, you know, wild card in this match. Somebody who has not wrestled a proper match in forever. And obviously he'd been going through like the, the, the training camp or whatever, the six week training camp he went through. But you know, there's just that difference of, you know, ring rust and ring shape and all that, and of course the factor of the crowd and the temperature and all that stuff and the nerves, it, it had to be a huge thing. But yeah, just seeing the rock, you know, the whole outside fight thing, like, well, that's how you know it's a rock match when you got like five or so minutes of just boring crowd fighting. That's what it was to me. It was like, oh God, this match, like for the star power it had, the star power is doing all the heavy lifting in this matchup because by and large, the match itself wasn't that great from a nuts and bolts perspective. But I mean, I think again, the charisma of The Rock, the way he sold uh, when he did take moves, I think really kind of helped elevate the match. <laughs> The Rock, you know, embracing this final boss, ultimate heel character that he is, you know, very comfortably and very easily slipped into over the last uh, several weeks. And he's, you know, dropping the F-bomb and he's yelling at the referee, basically threatening to fire the referee if he ever tries to enforce any kind of boundaries on the bloodline to the point the referee has to just walk up to Cody and say, sorry, I can't do anything because the final boss told me so. At one point, Roman's nose starts bleeding and he sells it kind of like, nobody makes me bleed my own blood. The Rock talks and trash to Mama Rhodes, saying, you know, the, the blood of Cody. First of all, the Mama Rhodes belt looked a lot cleaner at WrestleMania than it did, like, on Raw when he put Cody's blood all over it. Like, I don't know what happened. Maybe the rain that night washed it all away, but I was expecting more of that just dried, caked on blood there, but we didn't quite get that. The Rock, give him credit, he does do a lot of selling in this matchup, and I think, again, it does help things. He takes a rock bottom uh, through an announce table by Cody. He takes the Cody cutter, takes a spear, an accidental spear from his own cousin in Roman and Reigns, and the selling he does after that is just tremendous. That's a meme face right there. Uh, we get this double stereo, the stereo pedigree spot from Reigns or from Rollins and Rhodes. And although The Rock is so big and inflexible, his arms cannot even go back more than like a few degrees <laughs> past his body. That was a pretty funny looking pedigree. Cody's going for some crossroads on Roman, but The Rock cracks his back with that weight belt, and that allows The Rock to finally get the last word. Hits The Rock bottom. Him, the people's elbow on Cody, and that's it. One, two, three, easy peasy. The Rock has defeated Cody Rhodes, and now, as Michael Cole said on commentary, Cody is screwed going into night two. Um, again, from a star power perspective, this match was very big, but uh, you know, they're saving some, it seems, for the main event. The match itself. Uh, again, from just kind of watching it, it's like, ah, eh, it's it's kind of it kind of clunky at times. It was kind of rough, you know. You felt the fact that The Rock hadn't wrestled in a while, and he's getting up there in years, and he's not the most mobile or flexible he's ever been. And so some of that, some of those deficiencies shown in the match, like there were some rough rough patches to be sure. Uh, as far as a night one main event, I don't think it ranks that high up there for me. But uh, again, the stakes involved made it interesting. The Rock, the novelty of The Rock being there, I think kind of helped elevate the match, kind of buoy it a bit. I think he certainly, he knew his role and I think he played it well. And again, his selling, it's something you miss, you know? And I think him doing that again and, and putting over Cody's offense the way he did and putting over the spear and showing that kind of dissension just for a brief moment, I thought was really well done. Uh, yeah, again, it was, it was a fine match. If, to end the night and knowing that you're getting another night of action, like it's fine, but if that was like, a main event for WrestleMania, like I think that would be kind of a disappointing one. We pivot in a way that blurs the lines of fiction and reality. We move on to night two of WrestleMania. The temperature in Philadelphia on Sunday was a bit warmer than the night before, which I think is a big reason why you didn't see as many of those weather bug graphics like in the corner as the night went on here. I think I only showed it two times on Sunday as opposed to like four or five, it felt like. Stephanie McMahon makes her way to the ring. That was a big surprise and I know she she was seen at the Hall of Fame ceremony on Friday wearing the, the ECW beret in honor of Paul Heyman. But uh, yeah, kind of a shocker there because she was, you know, ousted or she left the company once Vince McMahon came back into the company last year and bought his way back in or forced his way back in. And uh, so something was seemingly up with that. Maybe they don't think that she's going to be in any trouble from the lawsuit. And maybe that's why they decided it was okay to bring her out there. She she welcomes, you know, everyone and she says the first 
first WrestleMania of the Paul Levesque era, putting over Triple H again as the new sheriff in town, the new guy who's running things and everything. And uh, she asks the fans, are you ready? She growls, welcome to WrestleMania. And yeah, then the show begins. There's a band of bagpipers playing the Green Hills of Tyrol, which is, you know, that's Roddy Piper's theme. I know that's hard to think of like other like standard like bagpipe songs. When you think of like bagpipes, that's the melody you think of generally. And there aren't too many other like standards that kind of, that immediately come to mind. Uh, but it's Piper's theme. And it felt just kind of weird you were playing it and there's no Piper there. So I don't know, pick something else. But uh, the match, the first match of the night is for the World Heavyweight Championship as Seth Rollins defends against Drew McIntyre. And to make things even more interesting, Charles Montgomery Punk is joined on commentary for this matchup. I tell you what, seeing Punk in a suit is just kind of a weird look, man. I'm still taking some getting used to that one. Uh, Seth coming out accompanied by the Philadelphia Mummers. It looks like a New Orleans WrestleMania, the way they're all coming out there. Uh, Seth Rollins is fit for this matchup here. Uh, for a split second, I thought it was like anime Michael Hayes in his final form. It was just the big robe and the hair. It was just an all-time look for Seth here. And of course, the big story is Seth's knee, Seth's back. Seth had just went through war in that main event the night before, and so he's very much compromised. And Drew is fresh as a daisy. He hits a Claymore right out of the gate, and we think that's going to be all she wrote. But no, there's more to it. Seth kicks out, and we get more of an actual fight here. I love Seth's scrappiness in this one. He is definitely playing from behind, but the way he continues to fight through and give a fighting chance here against the healthier Drew McIntyre is really fun to see. I think that uh, you know there's also that play between like Drew and Punk. They're shouting at each other as the match goes on, and you know there's no love lost between Punk and Rollins. Rollins, like I said, he is putting up a fight. He's putting out a lot of offense for someone who is as down as he is. Like he counters out of a future shock DDT attempt on the floor, hits a pedigree on the floor uh, that's not quite enough. To put Drew away. Hits a few stomps, but again, he cannot put the challenger down. And to his credit, though, he is kicking out of a lot of stuff of Drew's. Drew hits like two more claymores at one point, and Seth is still kicking out. Uh, Seth is, uh, Drew's in total disbelief. And finally, one more claymore to put Seth away, and that's it. Drew emphatically wins the matchup and wins the world championship in front of fans at WrestleMania. That is just a cool ass moment and it was a great match. You've got this moment here after the match where Drew just can't let it go with CM Punk. He's just like basically taunting Punk at the announce table, who at this point has just been kind of like very, he's not been doing anything, not been getting aggressive. And then finally, you know, Drew does kind of a crotch chop to Punk and that, 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 that set him off there. That was all he needed to see. So he trips Drew up on the table. He takes off the arm brace he had for his triceps injury and it decks Drew in the face with it, knocks him out. Then suddenly Damien Priest's music plays. And then you've got the Archer of Infamy himself coming down, seeing your money in the bank, cashing in the briefcase. He he gets in there, he choke slams Drew McIntyre, and bingo bango, you've got a new world champion in Damian Priest. What has happened here? You've got Drew looking in total disbelief as Punk sits on the announce table and just mocks Drew all the way home. That was a crazy moment uh, to start this show. I mean, the match we saw with Drew and Seth. That was really strong opener. That was a great matchup, told a great story. And then this twist at the end, I didn't even, like, you know, in my predictions, I didn't even think about Damian Priest cashing in. That was the farthest thing from my mind for some reason. But like, it made all the sense in the world to have that there and, um, you know, Priest is just, he's one of those Triple H guys who I think has been really well built in the last few years from NXT onward. And it's so cool to see him get that chance. And, uh, you know, it's great to see the title picture get shaken up a bit. Not your usual players that we've been seeing, you know, for the last couple of years. And I think they waited patiently and the time he had with the Money in the Bank contract was pretty strong. And he wasn't booked like a jobber. I love that, you know, like... It, Historically, the Money in the Bank winners are always lost all the time, then they cash in, and then it makes a bigger deal, seemingly. But, like, no, you've got to have, like, strong people doing that stuff. So I think having him be booked as well as he was in the grand scheme of things to cash in, I thought was incredibly well done. And, like, yeah, it's, like, heel on heel, sort of, but I think that's fine. I don't think, you know, Damien's turning 
babyface anytime soon. But yeah, that was just a really crazy moment. I was expecting it'd be a full circle thing where Damian would cash in on Seth Rollins because it was Rollins who cashed in at Mania 31. So I was kind of visualizing that, but no, I think it was, uh, yeah, a very uh, exciting way to start things off. Hall of Famer Snoop Dogg, he's got his own belt too, and he's going to be doing commentary for this next matchup. It's a Philadelphia street fight as Bobby Lashley and the Street Profits take on the Final Testament with special guest referee, another WWE Hall of Famer, Bubba Ray Dudley. In the full, you know, referee uniform, he wasn't even wearing the shorts to go with it. Uh, that was a very different look for Bubba Ray here in this matchup. And this thing is just wall-to-wall -wall chaos, not just for the eyes, but for the ears as well. Because, man, Snoop Dogg on commentary was a big bright spot on this show for me. Much like how he saved the day the previous year at WrestleMania when Shane McMahon tore his quad and Snoop and Miz had to kind of bullshit their way through a match <laughs> in moments afterward. Snoop is just a treasure in this uh, doing commentary. He calls the table a picnic table, does a Yogi Bear impression. He is just so excited. He is so happy to be calling this match up. And that happiness is very infectious as you watch the match. It's a very enjoyable, just big weapons brawl. That's all this thing is. And I think that all six guys in this matchup really play that well. A lot of kendo sticks being used in this matchup. A lot of them breaking under the weight of this thing too. You see them just being used. They're splintering. They're shattering into a million pieces. One of the members of AOP just holding up this broken handle at the, the twisted remnants of the kendo stick he was using. At one point, Karrion Cross shoves a special referee Dudley. Bubba Ray does not like that. He puts on the special Dudley glasses to let you know you messed with the wrong guy. Uh, then you've got this moment where he's just kind of directing traffic and telling, you know, the pride, telling Lash and the Street Profits how to like get in position for the big was up, which gets a huge pop from the audience. We get a big get the tables moment. They get a table out. They put Carrion on top of it and it just breaks immediately under his weight. I love that. And so then, not to be deterred, they pull out a backup table, which gets another huge pop. And that time it works. That one stays still as they put Carrion on it. And you've got Ford hitting a beautiful frog splash onto him through the table for the win. Uh, again, this was just a very crazy brawl. It does remind me a lot of the Chicago Street Fight from 13 with Ahmed Johnson and LOD versus The Nation, which, again, I think was one of the better matches of that show. I loved the frenetic nature of that one, just how absolutely batshit it was. And there was a bit of a spirit of that uh, in this one here. And of course, you got the spirit of ECW living on with Bubba Ray Dudley there with the tables, uh, you know, the EC dub chants uh, fully alive and well in this show. And by the way, Sunday's crowd, like I mentioned, way better, way more animated, way louder. Uh, on Sunday than they were on Saturday. It turns out just thawing them out a little bit was the key. A backstage interview where Kayla Braxton talks to one of the newest Hall of Fame inductees and Paul Heyman asking, hey, what are bloodline rules? And Heyman says, it's whatever the bloodline deems fitting, but at a baseline, it's no disqualification, no count out those kind of bloodline rules. He has a great line in this promo too, where he says, you know, one man's going to win the championship and the other's going to go home to his wife, Brandy. I thought that was such a killer line. Then we see LA Knight drive into the uh, stadium, drive into the parking lot with his fancy Slim Jim mobile. And then we go to our next matchup here as Los Angeles Knight takes on Apache Junction Styles. Thanks to everyone in the comment section from the predictions video who recommended great AJ initialed city names for me to use here. As LA makes his way to the ring, he gives the keys to the Slim Jim car to this nice little old lady who won the contest. What is she going to do with that vehicle? The look in her face says it all. She's not ready. Show up right here. Oh. Yeah. As you might expect, there are a whole lot of yeah chants in this matchup. Pretty much any move that LA gets off more than once in succession is going to have a yeah to accompany it, whether it's like a punch or driving AJ's face into the announce table. It's all good, but AJ certainly putting up a fight. You know, he's definitely taken LA to the limit in this thing. These two TNA legends squaring off. I still can't get over the fact that they were these two guys who really made their biggest names, arguably in TNA, but they never crossed paths as competitors there. I think it's so fascinating. 
to me. Anyway, you know, like I said, Styles has really got LA on the ropes at some point. He's got him in the calf crusher for the longest time. Uh, they're fighting on the outside and Knight pulling the padding back to expose that uh, the plastic covering over the concrete floor. Uh, gets hit with a back body drop uh, onto the hard concrete, but is just barely able to avoid the count out and get himself back in the ring. As he wraps his leg around the post and has a meat stick on it. A beautiful springboard 450 attempt by Styles is countered with some hellacious looking knees. Both men looking pretty sore after that spot there. Multiple times where each guy's trying their respective finishers. There's the BFT attempt. There's been the phenomenal forearm attempt. Finally, uh, LA sweeps the leg out of that springboard and hits the BFT onto AJ to win the match. So big old win for AJ here. The matchup, it was what it was. It wasn't a fantastic match. It wasn't like a mind-blowing match, but it was a solid match what it needed to be. AJ looks great in this thing, and LA looks even better with that win. It was a big win for him. It's the only matchup on this entire show, entire weekend of shows, that I got dead wrong for my predictions. So I'm willing to take that one. But it was, uh, yeah, it was a good match, and I think it's going to be a good year for LA Knight. Then it's time for the Hall of Fame presentation. You've got the U.S. Express. You've got Thunderbolt Patterson. you got Bull Nakano. Atta Johnson representing Leah Maivia. you got Muhammad Ali. Then finally, the headliner of this year's Hall of Fame, Paul Heyman, coming out with Roman Reigns' belt. But as he's doing that, I just kept thinking, man, everyone's got a belt! I liked how on both nights they showed like a trailer for the Bray Wyatt documentary and then they would come back to the live audience with Bray's music playing and the fireflies. Really cool tribute to Bray on both of those nights. It's time for the US Championship Triple Threat match as Logan Paul defends against Randy Orton and Kevin Owens. Uh, I liked all the entrances in this matchup. They were all very special for different reasons. Like uh, Logan Paul coming out in the big Prime truck. I could have swore he was gonna spray Prime out of that giant bottle onto the fans, but no, he just shoots the set and it makes the pyro go off. Uh, then you got Kevin Owens in the back. We get kind of the mirror image of when he was there for Sami Zayn before the IC title match. Sami's there to wish Kevin Owens good luck saying it's your turn now. Uh, I loved Owens aesthetic for this entrance like the ECW themed branding for his logo and on his gear. He comes out driving down on the golf cart and then when Orton comes out he backs it up and lets Orton go on a ride on the back and he gets that kind of Wrestlemania cart entrance on the golf cart. That was pretty fun. And the match here, the story they're telling here right away is that Orton and Kevin are these kind of newfound friends and they're just taking turns beating the hell out of Logan as this match goes on. Paul tries to let them fight each other, but they're having none of that as this match goes on. They're taking turns like doing the back suplex on the table. So, oh, that's how you do the move. Oh, I see it now. And it, it goes this way for several minutes until finally it comes time to one of them trying to pin Logan. And then, you know, Orton and Owens reluctantly, well, let's have this fight. And they start fighting. Fighting. I think it's just funny because Orton and Owens are two guys who are extremely well known for betraying their friends and we've got a little bit of that in this one. From there we get some great action between all three of these guys. Uh, near the end, Logan producing the brass knucks once again. That plays heavily into the rest of this matchup. Orton's got the match won. Suddenly the prime bottle that accompanied uh, Logan out to the ring earlier pulls Randy out and it unmasks to reveal I Show Speed, uh, who is a streamer, evidently. Once again, two years in a row, they had somebody in the prime bottle who I got no clue who this guy is. Anyway, he gets in Orton's face, Orton kicks him, and I Show Speed has like one of the nastiest falls where he falls and slides back a couple of feet because of like the cushing on uh, his suit. It's ripped apart, and then we get this big RKO on the, the announce table uh, onto him, and boy, he takes that bump like a champ though, I'll give him that. KO is on a big run near the end, he hits his finishers on both guys, he wants to hit the pop-up powerbomb onto Orton, who counters it into an RKO, but then uh, Logan slips in, he, he beats up Randy, throws him out, hits a nice frog splash onto Kevin to win the match, and by hook or by crook, retain the US Championship. We don't get America, America, we're still waiting on that one, but I will say this was a fun matchup. I think, you know, I love the uh, chemistry with Orton and Owens. Their kind of play toward each other uh, when it goes from friendship to back to fighting each other, I thought was really well done, very entertaining. Uh, we get again the cameo from somebody in the prime bottle getting beat up. You know, I think that's a fun recurring bit now. It's the new Pete Rose trend uh, at WrestleMania. And so that was fine. And so yeah, the match was what it needed to be. I 
think it was, yeah, great for, you know, displaying Logan Paul once again. I think he did a great job playing that just a shitty heel. And Owens and Orton uh, holding it together as the veterans, making it a, a very entertaining matchup. In your semi-main event for the Women's Championship, Io Sky defending against her former best friend and the winner of this year's Women's Rumble, Bailey, who got this big Egyptian goddess entrance for her, and she was carried out by a few guys in masks. I'm sure at least one of those guys is a future North American champion in the next couple of years. Uh, but that's a pretty impressive entrance. I have to admit, though, Athena pulls off the wings better than Bailey. In all seriousness, though, this was a great match. I would say it was a little bit stronger than the Rhea Ripley Becky Lynch match the night before. I think this one told a great story, and I think their chemistry was really just on point for this one. EO kind of being the high flyer, uh, punctuating so many things with her high flying offense. Bailey sometimes having answers for, but other times not. The story here being that Bailey's knee, surgically repaired knee, is under attack, so she's really uh, EO's going for that. These two are trading flying move attempts. You know, EO goes for the over the moon salt, and the knees go up. Bailey goes for an elbow drop, but EO moves out of the way. Rose plant attempts. EO flips out of one of them, which I thought was really impressive. Bailey hits the flying elbow drop and the rose plan to defeat EO Sky and win the women's championship, finally getting her solo WrestleMania moment, her moment in the sun and the spotlight and all that stuff. She's the last of the four horsewomen to finally get that moment. And uh, boy, uh, pretty deserving. I, again, a really, really strong matchup here. I loved how the fans were just in it all the way. The uh, Hey Bailey chants were just in full force and constant loop on this one. And I think that was really cool that the fans were just into it, supporting Bailey, and it was a really satisfying matchup. Uh, not much more I could say about it. I think it's the strongest Bailey has looked in some time. And with that, it is time for the main event of all main events. It's for the undisputed WWE Universal Championship as Cody Rhodes once again challenges Roman Reigns in a rematch from last year's WrestleMania. Cody coming out in a giant tribute to Triple H. It's the American Nightmare Skull Mask. And hey, is it open mic night up in this bitch? Brandy Rhodes accompanies Cody to the ring as well. It was fun to see Brandy get this moment, but I'm like, please don't become a regular character. The match begins and it goes much better Better, I would say on the whole than the main event from the previous night when it's just uh, Cody and Roman these guys work really well together and the fans you know like I said from night to night they are way more electric they're way more amped and much more invested as this match goes on in the early going uh, one of my favorite parts is when you know Roman's talking his trash and Pat McAfee on commentary just goes the tribal chief's talking his shit I'm like man everyone gets to swear now in the Triple H era uh, there's also a moment where uh, Roman hits the crossroads on Cody and then like we get the kick out and he's just like that move's not beating anybody of course that move's not gonna work I thought that was some epic trolling by Roman there as the match goes on Jimmy Uso comes to interfere but Jay Uso shows up to run interference on that the two of them fly off the ramp and through some tables and boy I was scared when that tackle happened because you didn't know where they were landing you could not see anything below them so I was really nervous for them for a second there the match is going on Cody has got his uh, crossroads in and then shades of mania 30 Solo Sokoa shows up and spikes Cody. We get the spike spear combo. Still not enough to put Cody away. He will not be denied here. Suddenly, John Cena makes his way to the ring to a massive pop. He wants revenge against the man who took him out in Solo. He beats him up. He hits Reigns with the attitude adjustment. And then, after all that happens, The Rock's music plays. And then he comes out. And we get the stare down with The Rock and Cena thrice in a lifetime. John is immediately put away with a rock bottom though. You won't be seeing him for the rest of this bit. Then suddenly the Shields music hits and like, I, I know I'm not alone in this. I saw a lot of people say this online. There was a brief moment where you're like, Moxley? <laughs> is like Dean Ambrose really gonna come back here? Like what's this, what could possibly happen? What more could you do to build up after all these different run-ins? And if we find out it's Seth Rollins, the way they filmed it, by the way, I think really took me out of it because like, you don't know what's going on, you just hear the music, you see the Shield name, everyone's confused, and then suddenly you see Roman just kind of come in and just immediately uh, attack Seth Rollins, who's dressed in the Shield outfit, 
in a chair, but it all happens so fast you kind of miss it. And you're just like, what, what happened here? Suddenly the bell tolls, the lights go out, and then when the lights come back up, The Undertaker has made his way into the ring, not necessarily dressed to compete. He choke slams The Rock, he teleports on out of there. So now we are down to Roman in the ring. He's got Cody on one side, Seth on the other, and he's got the chair in his hand, and Roman just can't let the pass go, and he decks Seth in the back with the chair, similar to when Seth betrayed Roman all those years ago. And that proves to be his undoing because he goes for one more spear on Cody, who blocks it, hits the three crossroads in a row, the cover, the win. Cody Rhodes has done it. Cody Rhodes has finished his story and is finally at top of the mountain as the WWE Universal Champion. What a moment that is. The 1300 plus day reign of Roman Reigns finally at an end as Cody celebrates in the ring. What a big moment this is. Take nothing away from Roman Reigns. He did, you know, all told, an amazing job holding it down as the champion. Yes, he didn't defend it a whole lot compared to other champions who held it for that long. Uh, and there were some times where you felt, okay, like, let's get this thing moving. Let's get, let's, let's finish this story. Let's move things on. People wanted to see it done a year ago, but they kept going with it. And I think, you know, when you listen to that reaction and you see how that all paid off, Maybe it was worth waiting an extra year, you know? I'll give them that. And I think that Roman, being that, you know, record-setting champion, you know, he's the the longest reigning champion of this era. It's going to be a long time before anyone beats that record, I'm pretty sure. And it's just, it's, I think it all boil, it all comes together in this really beautiful way. And I think that whole Avengers assemble moment, I had my doubts that it was going to happen, but it's WrestleMania 40. You got to go big. And you, the, the constant one, two punch or whatever it's like, it's, it's John Cena, it's The Rock, it's The Undertaker. They're all helping to try and help out Cody. And then ultimately, You've got that moment, the story told between Roman and Seth and how Seth has always been a thorn in Roman's side ever since the breakup. And how, you know, you think about their match they had uh, at the Royal Rumble last year and how that was inconclusive. And then you play that beat here and it works so well. It's ultimately Roman's downfall because he can't let that go. That is some brilliant long-term storytelling. And I love the way that played out in this matchup here. It was everything about the excitement that you saw in last year's Mania match, but they just upped it so much to create this really special moment. And you have so many of the baby faces coming out to celebrate with Cody. They carry him on his shoulders. He brings the belt to Mama Rhodes. He hands it to Michelle Rubio and you hear Michael Cole yell, damn it, I love professional wrestling. And damn it, so do I, because I started tearing up. I was so emotional looking at that. What? A moment that was for the Rhodes family, for WWE. It was just, it was this this uh, combination of all these these things, these things you were waiting for for the payoff, and it just came off. And I think one of the most satisfying ways imaginable. I mean, you, it's it's a great main event. It's a great way to end the show. Cody thanks the fans on the live mic afterward. He wants to thank Bruce Pritchard and Triple H who come out like, you know, very humble of Cody to do that. But I think you're really hammering home at the end of the day. This is the Triple H era. Yep, it sure is, because it's all about him at the end of the night. You know, after all this build, all this wait for Cody to finish the story, Cody immediately defers to Triple H. Like, I know. I know it's the Triple H era now. We have been made painfully aware of this. Uh, but I mean, you know, Hammer's at home, and you just look at the booking of WrestleMania across the two nights. Like, who won? You know, what, what's going on with the champions? Like, the long, the, the, the last vestiges of like Vince's choices and Vince's decisions as champions and everything all wiped away because now you have all these new champions that are like seven title changes at all over the course of the two nights. Uh, you know, they, it was an emphatic statement. This absolutely was the beginning of like the new era, the new reign of ownership between, you know, Triple H and Nick Khan and Stephanie McMahon's back now and Bruce Pritchard is there and Paul Heyman is, you know, one of the trusted creative minds, you know, helping so many people in the locker room. And like this is, and not to mention the agents, the other producers that work under all these guys. And like this is the dawn of a new era for sure. And Cody is ushering in that era. And they did it in a way that didn't feel like it was forced. It didn't feel like lol Cody wins. 
It didn't feel like it was something the fans didn't want to see. The fans have been dying for this, clamoring for it, and they finally got it. And I tell you what, Cody as champion has a lot more potential in 2024 than Roman Reigns if he still held the belt. Because like now, Cody's got all these built-in people that he could fight with. He could have another match with Seth Rollins, who literally was his shield in the fight against uh, Roman Reigns. Fighting against Gunther, who now has freed up. He's not the champion, the IC champion anymore. Uh, and their history in the Royal Rumble last year. So many ways you could go with Cody as champion. And yes, that story is finished, but you know, the potential for new stories and stories continuing, uh, they are so vast now that we have finally broken away from like the death grip of the bloodline. So yeah, that was WrestleMania 40. And I'm not gonna do star ratings like I said, but I will give the whole overall show an A grade. I mean, this was just a kick-ass mania from top to bottom. And I don't think it's just recency bias here. I think that this is gonna go down as one of the strongest of all time. It is a statement piece for the Paul Levesque Triple H era. Like, the right people won, the fans got what they wanted by and large, and the potential for what lies ahead just this year alone is so great based on what we saw here at WrestleMania. You know, Roman Reigns did an amazing job carrying the banner as their champion. Got a little overshadowed by The Rock at the end here, but where is that gonna go as the year progresses? Uh, Cody finally finishing the story. You know, he, they didn't luger him. They actually pulled the trigger on him and they gave him the belt. And I think, you know, he's going to do a great job as champion. The, you know, the chase is always more exciting than the rain uh, historically. So we'll see where that goes. But man, like uh, the way they're running things now, they say pro wrestling is back. And if that's the case, then I think we're in for some really interesting stuff from WWE in the years to come. But what did you think of WrestleMania 40? What were your favorite matches and moments for each night? And what do you think of the big completion of the story for Cody Rhodes? I wanna hear about that in the comments section below. Be sure to give the video a thumbs up if you like it, subscribe to the channel, and hit that bell icon for all the notifications. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.